Hello and welcome to a very special Faith and Friends. Our topic this week is cancer. In the next 30 minutes, you're going to meet some local residents who've experienced cancer in a very real way. Maybe it was a personal diagnosis or that of a family member. Last week, we introduced you to two of the students and one of the teachers involved in the making of this cancer documentary. Well, here it is, written, produced, and edited by the students of the Lima South Magnet SciTech 8th grade class. This is Living On. We, the 8th grade class of Lima South Science and Technology Magnet, wanted to tell the honest account of the emotional journey of cancer survivors and those family members who are surviving life after loss. We sat down with some staff of the Lima City Schools and community members and had them share their stories with us. My name is Amanda Markley. My name is Bob Ohm. I work for Children's Media Group. My name is Samantha Tippy. I am a Title I teacher at Heritage Elementary. My name is Sharon Carr and I am a fifth grade teacher at Liberty Arts Magnet. My name is Brett Hammon. I'm a music teacher at South Science and Technology Magnet School. I am Rochelle Penn. I work at West Middle School as the building coach. My name is Jill Ackerman and I serve as the superintendent for the Lima City Schools. Approximately 39.6% of men and women will be diagnosed with cancer at some point during their lifetime. I was diagnosed in November of 2008 with inner carcinoma breast cancer. I was diagnosed with stage three. It was a very aggressive estrogen hormonal based cancer. We sat down to get our results just like you would sit down after a, a, the doctor would come in after a surgery or anything and tell you how things went. Um, it was a nurse who took us into the room and she just kind of just she had a, a book with her a scheduling book and we had to make the decision of a surgeon actually right then and there and immediately my husband and I just broke down into tears because that was not at all what we thought we were going to hear. Um, I had breast cancer. Um, it was called DCIS in situ. Um, it was uh, caught very early, so it was, I don't have a stage. It was stage zero, but they call it grade three. I did not have any symptoms. Um, because I had a sister that was diagnosed with breast cancer when she was 33, um, I started getting mammograms when I was 20, 28 years old. Um, so this was just a routine mammogram. My reaction when I found out was, I guess I wasn't in total disbelief because of the strong family history. I, I guess I knew that, event, I just felt eventually that I would probably end up with some type of cancer. I wasn't completely surprised. So to be honest with you, I don't remember the thoughts going through my head. I remember you know, where I was, you know, my husband sitting next to me. Um, and the doctor that told me was very kind and I, I just took the information and asked, what do we do next? Every day, at least 40 children are diagnosed with cancer in the U.S. alone, with 175,000 children being diagnosed worldwide each year. My cancer is called retinal blastoma and I was diagnosed with it as an infant about 11 months old. My parents began to notice that I was having to stand too close to the television, wasn't reacting to light and so forth. And through a series of tests, I was determined to have this cancer. It is a very rare, often hereditary form of cancer that forms in the retina, moves back through the optic nerves, and if it's uncontrolled, can go to the brain. So, for that reason, both of my eyes had to be removed when I was 11 months old. I have no recollection of light or sight or colors or any of those sorts of things. 35% of people who have developed cancer did not survive the disease. The family member that I lost to cancer was my husband, Paul Penn. He had lung cancer, um, small cell lung cancer. When my husband was diagnosed, he had stage three. He thought that he may, might have had a mini stroke or a stroke, and um, we had an, the doctor ordered an MRI. 
to, to see if that's what had happened because he was having some symptoms that um, went along with stroke. The doctor called, um, said that he wanted to see my dad um, to bring family member. Uh, the doctor said that uh, the MRI showed that he didn't have a stroke. He had two brain tumors. My mother suffered from ovarian cancer, and when it was discovered, it was at stage four. So my mother did not survive ovarian cancer. She, when it was discovered, it was in January of 2001. Um, so for a, for a year, she did aggressive chemotherapy, had, a, had surgery, had a hysterectomy, and then went into remission for an entire year. So we celebrated the remission. Um, and then shortly after Christmas of the following year, it returned, and she um, became very sick very quickly, and in about a six-month period of time, she passed away. More than 90% of all lung cancers are caused by smoking, and 22% of all cancer deaths are due to lung cancer resulting from smoking. Um, my mom, she had small cell carcinoma, which is lung cancer. She had small cell lung cancer because she started smoking when she was 16 years old. Like I said, she was 45 when she was diagnosed. That's almost 30 years of smoking. It doesn't look like a big deal right now, a cigarette here, a cigarette there, but it just grows and grows. So I think the one thing that I try to spread with everybody I know, and, and this is including my family members who still partake in smoking and everything, Watching her go through that was the toughest thing I've ever done, and I don't want my kids to do that. Up until the 1960s, cancer treatments were often ineffective. With modern research and cancer treatments, 14.5 million in 2014 survive, and it is expected to rise to almost 19 million by 2024. When I was diagnosed with cancer, there was, there was no treatment, no chemotherapy, no radiation, no any, it was eye removal or in my case it would have meant death because can, as I said the cancer will go back to the brain. So there weren't many options um, and it was a difficult decision but they did you know what they thought they had to do. After carrying my son, um, if you've ever known anyone who was pregnant, a lot of times they have hormonal signs where they cry a lot or things upset them. Well, when I was pregnant, that you still you have those hormonal and the hormones is what the cancer fed on. I had a bilateral mastectomy and then when they got the results back from that, they actually um, found cancer cells in my lymph nodes underneath my arm. So I had to go back in and have another surgery to have more lymph nodes removed until they were down deep enough that they didn't find any more cancer. Then after that, I started chemotherapy the day before Christmas. I guess I wasn't in total disbelief because of the strong family history. I, I guess I knew that, even, I just felt eventually that I would probably end up with some type of cancer. Anytime you have a strong family history of cancer, you need to make sure that the people, you know, if they're females obviously are getting the screenings that they need. Um, mammograms and other screenings. I had my surgery on January 17th. I just had a lumpectomy, um, which was an, or an outpatient surgery. Um, and then I healed, I had about two or three weeks of healing. And then I started my radiation therapy, which was daily. And I just went every morning before I went to work for those radiation treatments. Not only does cancer take a physical toll on somebody's body, but often cancer patients and their families face some degree of depression, anxiety, fear, or distress when cancer becomes a part of their lives. When my mom found out she had cancer, I was with her at the hospital in the emergency room. And my reaction to finding out that she had cancer was um, very sad. Certainly, not, I wasn't real surprised. She had been sick for a while. Um, I, w I was sad and I was very scared for her. So I really wanted to be there to take care of her, to help. So I spent a lot of nights in the hospital with her. The people were very nice. They would brought me a little bed of my own and I would stay there with her and then I would get up in the morning and I would go to North Middle School where I was the principal 
Um, and then I would go back up there at the end of the day and I would stay there with her. So I felt, I, I felt sad that she was in the hospital, but I felt a real sense of needing to be there to, to entertain her and to help take care of her and just to watch over her. Our situation was, was kind of, it was, was really just a whirlwind because um, when, when he was diagnosed with cancer, he was told he would have three months to live. It ended up being three weeks. I've had other people that I know that had cancer and um, some relatives. And, um, but I guess when it's an immediate family member, um, it, it really makes you realize, you know, that, yeah, this is real. Um, it hits you hard. It really hits hard. Um, she was the matriarch. She, was, she has all brothers, and she's always taking care of all of them. So when everybody found out, we were all devastated. It was a very, very difficult time. Emotionally, she changed completely. She was a very strong woman my entire life. Never saw her cry. And then once, you know, she was diagnosed with this and realizing she's 45 years old and that this could be the end, she, she got very sad. I wanted to, you know, be around to see my daughter, you know, graduate from college and go on to be married. And, you know, I wanted to continue my life with my husband. So obviously the, or those were the first two people that I thought of when I had this diagnosis. However, I didn't, you know, think of it as a death sentence by any means because I knew that they caught it early and I knew that I know all the advancements that they are doing in cancer and the research and stuff is, makes, I guess it just made me more positive and wanting to, to do what I needed to do. I had a 15 month old son and I was, when I was first diagnosed, it was very hard because I thought he was never going to know who his mother was. I could not pick him up was a big issue. He always wanted to be held. Um, he was, I rocked him to sleep every night and so I would sit in the rocking chair and someone would put him on my lap so that I could still rock him to bed. He was a hair player. He would ha play with my hair and before it fell out, he would sit there and play with it and play with it and by the time he fell asleep he was covered in hair. So that's when I actually just shaved it so that what fell out was a lot smaller and I didn't have, we had hair everywhere in the house. He was diagnosed in September of 15 and he died in January of 2016 so it was a very short period of time. He had been sick for a long time. As far as um, in November of 2014, we found out that he had a small clot in his right lung and he had pneumonia. And, but through it all, he loved to work out, he loved to walk, he loved to be with his family, and he did all that. And the only time that changed was probably the last month of his life because we spent the majority of the time in the hospital. My wife and I have a daughter, Gina, who is a physical therapist, works here in Lima, has her doctorate of physical therapy, who lost one of her eyes to retinoblastoma, as I did. I had three younger sisters, each of whom lost one eye because of retinoblastoma. I spent way too much time in, in a hospital with our kids, have spent way too much time um, in hospitals for friends and relatives and work colleagues and people who have who have known who have been affected by cancer that the minutes or hours between when a diagnostic test is done and you find out the results are the longest of your life people who have had cancer have a greater chance of getting cancer in a different place than people that haven't had cancer yet. That's why I, I only have an only child, because if I had another child, I would go through those hormones again, and I would probably get cancer again. Studies have proven that anyone who has had cancer is at a higher risk of developing another form of cancer. It is something that I often think about, so it, 
doesn't affect how I live, but it certainly is one of those things that I know can become a reality for me at any time. Many people realize the importance of life when confronted with the diagnosis of cancer. When you think about the bond that you have with someone who suffers from cancer, probably when, when it's all over, said and done, the thing that, I'm, that I feel the most blessed about is the fact that we spent so much time together during that time that she was ill and I was able to take care of her. So that, that's something that is in my heart and it makes me feel really good. Well, I was 24 and I was still living at home. Um, actually, all my sisters were. So I have, at that time, I had a 17-year-old sister and a 21-year-old sister. I was still um, going through college, so I kind of had to step up and take on that mom role for everybody. <laughs> she cared. Um, she was a very good woman. It's just very hard. She, she died very young. So I think the one thing that I try to spread with everybody I know, and, and this is including my family members who still partake in smoking and everything. Watching her go through that was the toughest thing I've ever done. And I don't want my kids to do that. So it's a good idea just to not, don't pick up a cigarette. You have to make yourself get through it. Think of what the person you've lost would want. It's, it's gonna be hard, it's not gonna be easy. I think I dwelled more on my, on my parents and my grandparents, you know, passing of cancer than on my own. It didn't seem that big of a deal to me when I went through the treatments. Um, it was harder for me to deal with, with when they went through it. The aftermath of the cancer as a little boy, my parents and the teachers who taught me at Delphi St. John's played a huge role in what some would say was a difficult thing for a blind kid to do. And because of my parents' influence, who refused to allow me to feel sorry for myself or to feel different than other kids, is why it is that I am who I am today and the way I am today in terms of my drive and determination and work ethic and so forth. Obviously, you don't remember times when you were 15 months old. So I wanted him to remember his mother, so I fought really hard. I think about things differently now after that I had cancer. Um, I'm, I live a little bit differently. We just, you know, we try to live to the fullest because, you know, I'm, I, I am here, I am alive, and I don't want to have to go through that again. I have, I'm a lot more patient than I was before. Now I'm just kind of, it's not, it's not, the, it's not a big deal just because of everything that I've went through. Mr. Penn, my husband, was a teacher for 35 years in the Lima City Schools. He was also a basketball coach for 31 years of, of that time, which coaching was his, was his uh, love, it was his passion, and uh, there are still young men walking around Lima today that talk about him all the time because he was a spectacular teacher and basketball coach. Um, and there's always, always stories about grandbabies and how he'd love to be with them. And I, you wouldn't think he would smile. You could see him and you didn't think he was smiling. But when I started looking at the pictures, I saw the dimples and he was always smiling when he was holding the grandbabies. That's probably my favorite, favorite. These women brought in this little blue Christmas tree. And the reason they do that is because when their mother was going through her cancer, um, she had to spend Christmas there at the hospital. And they thought that this would be a good way to just brighten up the room. It's just a little blue Christmas tree that sat on the windowsill, but it was just a little bit of hope right there. And I keep that in my house now. My mom was always big on, we went to the um, ONU Holiday Spectacular every year. So that's something that me and my girls, I have four daughters now, um, and we always make sure that we do fun little trips together and just have fun. She was a very active person. She was, she worked, um, she was a cook. She loved her job, so she was not able to work. She, was, she loved to walk. She would walk miles every day. 
Um, she was just very active. As long as I knew him, he was a teacher. Um, even after he retired, he um, worked for, he volunteered for the, like the reading programs, the STAR program when they had it in the elementaries. Um, he loved helping kids. He loved helping people. Um, and he, he volunteered with kids until he just physically couldn't drive anymore, couldn't see to drive. And, um, I mean, that was just his passion. A lot of people, a lot of people benefited from that. Um, after he passed, I can't tell you how many people said, you know, your dad did this for me, your dad did this. That's who he was. That's who he was. My mom was laid off, so it was a godsend that she was actually laid off because she would come over and she would take me to chemo, and then she would bring me home, and chemo would make you very, very tired. And so I would come home and I would just go to bed. And so while I was sleeping, because she didn't want to leave me, she would clean my whole house, she would do our laundry, she would do the dishes, so she would have everything ready to go. It's a picture that sits in my window in my kitchen. And it's a picture of my son and I. And I'm com we, we were at a wedding, and so I'm dressed up, but I'm completely bald and he's in his tuxedo. And when my hair started growing back, my husband told me that I had really big ears and that they stuck out when I was bald. But of course he would never tell me that when I was actually bald because he didn't want to make me feel bad. But now that I had hair again, he could tell me that I didn't look great when I was bald. Elizabeth, she's a great kid to begin with. Even, as, even when she was younger, she was very mature. So just listening to me, um, she went to the Bible and found Bible verses and gave them to me, and that encouraged me. Um, I know that, you know, deep down it was kind of bothering her, but she went and talked to different people and, and had them listen to her so she didn't have to bring her worries to me. Um, she very, was very helpful around the house. She always has been. So um, just a very good support there, and my husband too. It's because I'm blind that I have Pippa, my guide dog, down here at my feet. and. She accompanies me most everywhere I go, and we have to walk to work every day instead of being able to jump in my Camaro and, and <laughs> drive to work. I got my first guide dog in 1975. I have had six females, five black labs, and one chocolate lab. Um, and when I am on the air at the radio station, they're I right there in the studio quietly just like she is now. This does not interest her in the least. Um, she really is, oh my goodness, you just had to get up. Uh, she, uh, so yeah, I, I've, had, I've had six of them. Advice that I would give would be that if you ever have any type of inkling, if you have soreness, if you have a history of breast cancer in your family, to never think, oh, I'm only in my 20s, it's not a big deal right now. Never think that it's not a big deal. Go and go to your doctor regularly. Go and get checked if you want to. It, you know, whatever you have to do, make sure that it's the best decision for you and never take anything for granted. I, first thing, the advice that I would give somebody going through cancer would be just to be positive. You know, don't think that this is the end of the world by any means. There's. There's so many positive things going on. There's so many people to help you out there. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to you know, go to people that have had cancer. Don't be afraid to go to your family members and tell them how you feel. Um, just don't keep it all inside. You decide every day what kind of day you're gonna have. If you wake up and think, oh, poor me, I can't see. I can't, I can't drive, it's raining out. I'm gonna be soaked when I get to work. It's a pretty good bet that's the kind of day you're gonna have. I think that a positive attitude in dealing with cancer, in dealing with life, in dealing with difficulties at work, in dealing with any situation that you find yourself in is of paramount importance. I have seen evidence in my life of people who have dealt with tremendous difficulties and situations, not just cancer, whether it be economic issues or personal issues, where a positive attitude has made a huge difference. 
and I don't think that there is anything more important than the realization that there are many things in life that you can't control. What you can control is how you're going to deal with it. Take each day as it comes. There's going to be good days, there's going to be bad days, and then there's going to be terrible days. It just hits you and you don't know why. It could be a song on the radio, anything. And you just got to take it as it comes. A lot of the things that, the way that I deal with my students are things that, you know, my mom taught me to just always be compassionate, always, even if you're having a rough day, smile and let those kids know that you care about them. I make an effort now to, to live my life like my father would. He was, he was a teacher for many years. Um, was always kind, um, cared for people, would do anything he could to help out people. So my goal is to try and be like him. So I would tell somebody who has a family member to be there for them, to stay positive and hopeful, and just be there with them and hold their hand, um, brush their hair, take good care of them, and make them feel really loved because that's what's most important. Pray. I would, if somebody, and I, and I have, if someone were to lose someone to cancer, I would tell them to pray and to breathe because sometimes you just have to remember to breathe because the pain is overwhelming. We set out to make a film. We needed a team of editors, directors, writers, interviewers, lighting, makeup, and camera crew. Each part of the team helped us to accomplish our goal in creating this documentary. It helped create a stronger bond between us as a class. Having to talk about intimate details of our teachers, superintendent, and community members' lives is a difficult and emotional task. Together, all these people learn about the process and each other to create this beautiful piece. Thank you for watching Living On, a documentary by the Lima South Magnet 8th grade SciTech students. We encourage you to re-watch the interview with three of the individuals involved with this project by visiting faithandfriends.wtlw.com. An all-new Faith and Friends show returns next week. Until then, have a great week, everyone. <laughs>